The topic today is on delirium in surgical patients. Delirium in surgical patients goes unrecognized in up to two-thirds of patients. It is expensive. It leads to poor outcomes in terms of function and cognition. It causes increased length of stay and increased mortality. The incidence and prevalence varies according to different surgeries. It occurs in up to 10 to 60% of patients and varies between post necrophema surgery, which is 65%, and aortic aneurysm repair, which is 33%. As elderly present with atypical presentation, remember that delirium may be the only manifestation of life-threatening illness in elderly patients. Diagnosis of delirium can be made using the confusion assessment method tool that requires acute onset with fluctuating cause with inattention together with altered level of consciousness or disorganized thinking. For delirium, the predisposing and precipitating factors. The predisposing factors include elderly, more than 75 years old, underlying cognitive impairment and dementia, sensory impairment, for example, either vision or hearing impairment, multiple comorbidities, as you're on multiple medications as well, poor functional status, especially patients who are wheelchair or bed bound, and malnutrition. Not all elderly get delirious. So what actually precipitates delirium? Precipitating factors include D for drugs, for example, polypharmacy, sedation or uh, withdrawal. E for any electrolyte or fluid abnormalities, for example, dehydration. L is for lack of sleep, which can be caused by noise or pain. Remember to provide adequate analgesia. I for any infection or severe illness. R is for restraint or reduced sensory input. I is for any form of intracranial abnormalities like stroke or tumor. U, urinary retention or constipation. And M is to do anything with the myocardium, for example, myocardial ischemia or arrhythmias. Do remember modifiable factors that can be within our control. For example, sleep deprivation, discontinue hourly parameters if possible, pain and anxiety, uh, please provide adequate analgesia, unfamiliar environment or frequent change of beds can also precipitate delirium, sensory deprivation, physical restraints, and also catheter and drips. There are medications that can precipitate delirium. Example of medications include anticholinergic drugs like oxybutynin, anorex, benzhexol. Sedatives like pethidine and diazepam can also cause delirium. Psychotrophics, polypharmacy, and also over-the-counter medications often used for cough, cold, and antihistamines. There are different types of delirium. For example, hyperactive, hypoactive, or mixed. Hyperactive delirium, not very common, but better overall prognosis. Hypoactive delirium is one of the common forms in up to 43.5% of patients. It goes unrecognized in 66 to 84% of patients as they are often apathetic and withdrawn. Mixed delirium is one of the most common forms. If you are faced with a confused delirious patient, please avoid restraints of any form. Try non-pharmacological measures first, which includes encourage presence of family members and ask them to sit with their loved ones. Provide orientation and interpersonal touch. Provide vision and hearing aids if available. Remove all indwelling devices like lines and catheters as soon as possible. Mobilize patients early if there are no contraindications, prevent daytime sleepiness with activities 
and provide uninterrupted sleep at night. Pharmacological measures should be reserved only for patients at risk of harm to self or others. There are many medications, for example, low-dose antipsychotics like haloperidol, risperidone and quetiapine. Remember side effects of this medication, which includes anticholinergic properties, orthostatic hypotension, extrapyramidal side effects, and prolonged QTC. For those who are confused and agitated, haloperidol can be used as a short-term measure. Oral dose is 0.25 to 0.5 mg BDPRN. Intramuscular is much higher, between 1 to 2.5 mg, which can be repeated every 30 minutes to a max of 5 mg. Lorazepam is often reserved as a second-line medication as a sedative and for alcohol withdrawal. It can also be used in those patients with Parkinson's disease and neuroleptic malignant syndrome who are confused. Since we know delirium is associated with poor outcome, it is better to prevent delirium than to treat or manage a delirious patient. One third can be prevented by targeted intervention. For example, if your patient is known to have underlying dementia or cognitive impairment, provide daily orientation and activities. Encourage early mobilization in the post-op period if possible. Ensure uninterrupted sleep at night. Provide adequate analgesia and avoid sedatives if possible. If you know that your patient usually uses glasses or hearing aid, it will be good to provide the glasses and hearing aid for your patients so that they can interact with their family and loved ones and are kept orientated during their stay in hospital. Patients in the hospital are prone to dehydration as they are often lying in bed and their cot sites are up. It is best to order for scheduled feeding at least 1.2 liters a day if there are no real contraindications. Act before disaster strikes. Don't wait until it happens.